Welcome to In The Workshop. This is all about how to make a Stuart Double Ten V work as it should. This package arrived in the post yesterday and it's very well packed I must say. When I opened it inside is a very nice Stuart Double Ten V. Really well built by the look of it, I can see this the minute I get it out of the packaging. So I'll put the packaging out of the way and have a look at it in close detail. This engine is very well engineered. Externally it appears to be perfect. So I wonder what the problem is. Sloppy bearings maybe? Bad timing? The valve not seating on the port face? I'll have a look at it. But no, none of those things. This engine is completely locked solid. The flywheel moves very slightly on the crankshaft and that's it. The rest of it is solid. Really solid, not a hint of movement. The first obvious thing to do is to flood all the moving parts with some 3-in-1 machine oil. This stuff creeps about and gets into the smallest crevice, so by oiling all of the moving parts and leaving them for a while, there's a good chance everything will free off. I'm being very careful not to miss any of the moving parts. I also put some of this oil into the inlet manifold, so with a bit of luck, the oil will find its way past the slide valves into the cylinders. The first thing I'm going to do though is sort out this flywheel. Someone's had a go at turning the flywheel to try and free off the engine, and the small slotted grub screw which holds the flywheel to the crankshaft, is a tiny bit sprained. So what I'm doing is removing the grub screw nearly all the way out, applying some machine oil and then screwing it back in. This engine is very dusty. It's been sat about by the look of it for a long, long time. One thing that surprised me though was how loose the cylinder head bolts were, so I would presume that before I got my hands on it, someone else has also had a go at fixing it, or at least having a look inside the cylinders. At this point I'm starting to be worried because I've seen some attempts at fixing engines that would make your toes curl. I need to know how solid this engine really is. So once I get the cylinder off I put some 3-in-1 oil into the cylinder and then I place this small piece of leather on top of the piston because I'm going to tap the piston with a piece of brass rod very, very gently. And for this I'm using a very small hammer and I'm using lots of lightweight taps with this very small hammer. The reason for the noise is that the engine is sat on my soundboard that I work on, which amplifies any sound when an engine is running, but it also amplifies any sound when I'm tapping things with hammers. So what happened after tapping the piston? Well, nothing moved at all. It's in exactly the same place as it was. The next step is to remove the other cylinder cover and loosen every part of the engine. Here I'm loosening the gland with a small screwdriver, needs just a gentle tap, that's it, that's gone. And now it's time to take off the other cylinder cover. Once again, the bolts are finger tight, so this should come off quite easily. I've speeded up the routine parts of this video just to save a bit of time. Nobody wants to watch me removing cylinder bolts in real time, not unless they're really weird. As I'm removing these cylinder bolts, I'm looking round the engine for evidence of rust, and there is none. It's as clean as a whistle. This cylinder cover refused to come loose, so I'm using a Stanley knife blade. A health and safety notice here, be very careful when using these blades, they're extremely sharp, and it needs the absolute slightest tap to persuade the very sharp edge of the blade to get between the cylinder cover and the main cylinder casting. I was very pleased to see that both of the pistons are slotted, so I can get a screwdriver in the top and rotate the pistons and remove them if necessary. But the very fact that the pistons rotate tells me that that is not the problem. If the pistons were stuck in the cylinder, they wouldn't rotate. So I haven't removed them, I've left them where they are. In this clip, I'm having a look at the big ends, and I've slackened off the bolts that hold the brasses together. I think that's about it, I've got everything loose. That is, apart from the eccentric straps, so I'll just undo those very slightly, slacken them off, they don't need to be tight. Now it's time to turn the engine upside down, sit it on a block of wood, and then tap the steel part, that's the crank web of the crankshaft, very, very gently, with a piece of brass and a tiny hammer. And this time it's starting to move. So now it's over to the lathe, and I'm not going to do what you think I'm going to do, not in a million years. The lathe power switch is in the off position. I'm merely holding the crankshaft securely in the chuck, to allow me to apply some of my special oil mixture and then physically rotate the engine around the axis of the crankshaft. And after rotating the engine in this manner for a short while, it seems to have freed off. 
I'm just giving the cylinder covers a bit of a clean with some scotch Brite to get rid of the grime that's on there. I'm not doing a thorough clean up on this engine, the brief is to repair it and make it go. When a customer sends me an engine for an assessment as to whether the engine is repairable or not, I initially charge a fixed fee for the time it takes to look at the engine because it's never just a case of looking, I always have to dismantle things. If the customer agrees to go ahead with the repair, I deduct this initial fee, which is normally £40, from the cost of the repair. This fee doesn't include return postage costs. It just covers the time it takes for me to assess the engine's problem. But it's often the case, like you're just seeing, that I've found the problem and I've fixed it. So luckily for this customer, that's all he's going to pay. £40 for the job, plus the return postage. I'm not sure whether this is going to go back to England or Switzerland. It's time now to see whether the engine will run on compressed air. I've pumped some oil into the inlet manifold. The airline's nearly connected. All I need to do now is turn on the air supply. Let's see what happens. Initially, it appears to need a bit of a helping hand. But once the oil that I've pumped in there found its way to the slide valve assemblies and the pistons in the cylinders, everything was fine. In this clip, I'm carefully tightening the small 7BA nuts that hold the steam chest cover to the steam chest itself, because I did notice a bit of a leak and they were loose. Before applying the air for a proper test run, I'm putting some more oil into the manifold and this is my special oil mixture, 50% superheater steam oil, the thick stuff, and 25% rapeseed oil that you get from the supermarket, and also 25% machine oil, like 3-in-1. This oil mixture is very slippery, it's a good all-round lubricant, because the very small steam engines, all of the parts, including the crankshaft bearings, will get warm too. So although thin machine oil penetrates very well on tight bearings, it's not good to use once the engine is in steam. And machine oil is no good at all for cylinder lubrication when the engine is in steam. The choice of oil on a steam engine is very important. Never use machine oil in a displacement lubricator and never use motor oil because motor oil has additives that can gum up the engine. Let's see how it goes now. Well, it seems to run fine now. All I need to do to make sure that everything is okay is re-tighten all the parts that are slackened off earlier, starting with the main bearings. I've had quite a lot of experience of doing this sort of thing, so if you're doing it yourself for the first time, don't be nervous, otherwise you will make mistakes, but do not over-tighten the parts. People, without exception, when they first work on a model engine, seem to think that these parts need tightening up using the same torque settings as the cylinder head bolts on your car engine. This is not so. If you do that, they will just snap off. These are 7BA bolts, very, very tiny little bolts. BA, by the way, stands for British Association. And it's a very old, now redundant thread form. But BA bolts are still very much in use on model steam engines. Before giving the engine another run, it's time to replace the oil. I did notice when the engine was running, the oil coming out of the cylinders was the right colour, so the cylinders aren't tight. This engine is extremely well made. Mechanically, it's one of the nicest double 10 Vs that I've seen. The paint job isn't stunning, but the rest of the engine really is. It's beautifully made by a very experienced craftsman. Let's give it another run and see how it goes. If you wonder why my hand is in the background messing about with a piece of cloth, that's to catch the oil coming out of the exhaust to stop it going all over the bench and all over the other parts that are on the bench.
When running on low air pressure, there's plenty of power from this engine and the crankshaft is perfectly straight. This is a beautifully made engine. I'm now going to wind it up and make sure nothing drops off it. Yes, I think I can pass that as being fit for service. If I want to be ultra, ultra picky, the timing is very, very slightly out. I'm adjusting the rear eccentric sheave because it's just a fraction, and I do mean an absolute fraction out. At this point, I'd just like to say I do not have obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD. I just like things to be right. There is a subtle difference. And that's near enough for rock and roll. What a lovely engine. I'm going to run it on the bench on compressed air for a day or so. And this is just to test it, you understand. Nothing to do with the fact that I could sit here for hours watching these simple engines rotating, particularly one as nice as this. So that's it. I'll leave you with it running. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.